Welcome to Brick Moon Fiction. The theme for this month's short story podcast is, timely enough, liberty. It's one of the founding principles of the American Constitution, and yet there's no consistent agreement on who is entitled to it and to what extent. With that in mind, we set our writers out to explore this theme with one other requisite. As a true sci-fi homage, they had to incorporate the Statue of Liberty in each story. Enjoy. Brick Moon Fiction presents Liberty Watch by Eric Del Carlo, narrated by Nicholas Thurkettle. Murdoch had seen the pomp, the martial precision of the troops, jackboots, combat coats, and the weaponry. Don't forget the weapons. What's a soldier without a big scary gun? He'd been worn out by the displays. The troops on Liberty Island were the best, or at least the showiest. They were the ones brought out whenever someone from the Department of Publicity was allowed to visit the New York quarantine. The Secretary of Publicity herself had given Murdoch this assignment. It was presented to him as an honor, and, of course, in its way it was. The job was high profile. It was a significant responsibility. His byline would be netted all over the nation and the nation's held territories. But he was old enough to have heard the oldest journalists tell hoary tales of reporters and bloggers who sought out the truth, who didn't accept marching orders, who weren't told what their stories would be before they even began writing them. He was just meat on the algorithm, and knew it, and had acceded to those conditions all his professional life, which was why he had his job and this current assignment. So what was the problem, he wondered, as the last drill was drilled on the parade grounds and the commandant gave his final pre-programmed statement. What was different about this task? He had everything he needed for the story, all the facts, all the stats, all the patriotic declarations. He had a flair for verbiage. He knew how to drop words together so that they satisfied and convinced. Software could almost do what he did. Almost. But a byline worked better with a face, and he had written for enough years that people recognized his style and liked it. But how would he write this piece up if he were an old-fashioned reporter, one looking for the truth? The thought prickled his flesh. He shivered in the twilight. They had left him alone on the tarmac. The exercises and demonstrations had finished up early. He had posed almost no questions, had simply recorded what he was shown and told. The helicopter which would take him away wasn't due yet for half an hour. The troops and officers evidently didn't know what to do with him, so they were just leaving him on his own. That was fine with Kelly Murdoch, what with how he was feeling at the moment, experiencing this strange and dangerous angst. He still didn't understand what was bringing it on in the first place. Was it the magnitude of this assignment? Had he simply hit some spiritual wall after years of being a complicit propagandist? He had been pacing aimlessly on the empty ground. He halted and felt his eyes drawn skyward. All day he had been working in the shadow of this monument. All day it had loomed over him and the soldiers and this island which was the command center of the quarantine. The obelisk so dominated the scene that he had effectively forgotten it. But it had pressed on his senses nonetheless, a subliminal weight, a metaphysical pressure. He had never stood before it until today, never been to New York. What was here, after all? Only the quarantine. Yet the Statue of Liberty had been an overpowering symbol for centuries, and it was one still, though reconfigured, repurposed. The head was an artillery piece, although the distinctive spikes remained, suggesting now cheval de frise, the anti-cavalry spikes of yore. The big gun swiveled, giving it quite a range over the walled-in harbor. Other hollows had been dynamited out of the massive copper body. There was a machine-gun nest halfway down her left arm, another on the breast, one at the hip. And, of course, the iconic searchlight turned tirelessly where the torch had once been. The light had come on with the gathering dusk, and that baleful burning eye swept back and forth over the dark city. The gun nests were no longer manned, but an artillery crew was always on duty up top. Murdoch had gotten the deluxe tour, he had dutifully noted the battlements and absorbed the well-worn facts about how the statue had been appropriated as a sentry tower, before the walls had even been erected around New York. Back then the guns had blazed, the cannon had rained shells on the newly established quarantine. Those condemned there could not be allowed out again. Murdoch gazed up at the gouges made in her, at the maw of the artillery piece and the pivoting searchlight. She could be restored, but they left her like this. The monument wasn't necessary as a practical guard post anymore. The quarantine had worked. Only on the rarest occasion was a new case ever discovered. The luckless individual was then brought in with vast fanfare. 
The automated boat transported her or him to the city, with the militarized statue looking on ominously. It made for an excellent visual, duly chronicled by the Department of Publicity. Hey, Murdoch, want a coffee? He started. Someone was standing before him. Uh, what else? Soldier. There were only troopers on Liberty Island, save for Murdoch himself. He blinked, nonplussed by the informal address. Uh, yes, please. The soldier turned, and he followed. The uniformed man was dressed as smartly as any of the others, but his gait was easy, the look on his youngish face nonchalant. He must be off duty, given the minor chore of babysitting Murdoch until the chopper arrived. Fine. Coffee still sounded good. The island wasn't large, less than fifteen acres, but every bit of it was in use. Barracks quartered many troops, and an armory could equip twice the number. From here a full-scale invasion of Manhattan could be launched. The bigger island could be taken in a matter of hours. But nobody wanted to take it, Murdoch reminded himself unnecessarily as they made for a small utility structure. If the quarantine ever had to be drastically dealt with, a missile strike would simply erase it. Every new session of the Emergency Congress proposed doing just that. As yet, the President for Life had vetoed each proposal. The space they'd entered was cramped, but it was evident right away what it was. A hidey hole. A clubhouse. The soldier pulled shut the door and waved Murdoch to a beat-up sofa while he zapped up a couple of coffees. The walls were plastered with printout and scribbled with graffiti. It was refreshingly unpretentious after a day of endless formalities. The soldier loosened his collar as he handed over the cup of coffee. Murdoch finally saw his name sewn onto the coat's breast. Caligaris. He was enlisted. He looked as battle-ready as any of the military specimens Murdoch had seen today. But there was intelligence in his face, and humor and sadness in his eyes. He took a cup for himself and sat on an overturned crate. Want to oil yours up any? Caligaris was reaching behind, among miscellaneous clutter. He came up with a pint and poured liquor into his coffee. Murdoch had already made room with a sip of the fragrant brew. He held out his cup. Thank you. Sure, Murdoch. They drank. The alcohol had some kick. You get your story? Caligaris's manner was even more relaxed now. With one slug of the laced coffee in him, Murdoch was feeling some of that ease as well. No need to get it, he heard himself say. Then, in a further moment of sudden dismay, he heard his mouth add, The story was served to me. Bad idea. Big mistake. Don't lip off in front of a soldier, even if he's not carrying his big scary gun. But Caligaris laughed immediately, as though he understood completely. There was an absurdity to all this today, and both men had been party to it. Anything you want to know? The younger man shrugged. Unofficial, I mean. I know your propaganda department wouldn't be interested. But you might be. It was an unexpected and downright perilous offer. Who was this soldier? Someone selected to spy on him, maybe. It could be the secretary had doubts about him, that she'd given him this plum assignment as an elaborate means of checking up on... No. Even for a political bureaucracy that encouraged paranoia, that was too much. Instead of replying, Murdoch glanced more closely at the walls. There were old radical pamphlets pasted up, most scrawled with derogatory comments, but there were official government proclamations too, and these were just as covered with irreverent annotation. Murdoch homed in on a picture, an old-time movie still, a glowering, eye-patched visage familiar to him. You know who that is? Caligaris asked. I took a course in subversive cinema at college. Ironic you have this character hung on your wall here in New York. But he escaped in that old movie, which goes against your whole theme, doesn't it? I think he's a badass. Again the soldier chuckled, adding more liquor to his cup. Murdoch drank a little more of his, still trying to stay on the right side of caution. But it was seductively pleasant to unwind some after this terribly exacting day, as well as the week of prep work, utterly unnecessary as it turned out, he had undertaken before being flown up here. Hell, the whole goddamn trip had been unnecessary. The only poetical flair he could add to the piece after being present on the scene were his impressions of the statue, and how fundamentally noble she still looked even in her abused state. No one would let him print any of that. He turned his mind back to what Caligaris had said earlier. There were things Murdoch wanted to know. He decided to take up the offer. Are there any escape attempts from the quarantine these days? He'd gotten the official answer from the commandant, which was none. The soldier said, Oh, now and then. Not like the old days, though. 
when we were pushing them back and cutting them down day and night. Back then they were swarming to get out. These days you can't even really call them escape attempts. Sometimes an individual will get on a homemade raft or walk out to the middle of one of the bombed-in half-bridges, but they aren't trying to get away. Murdoch sat up on the ratty sofa, intrigued. What then? Caligaris' smile was weary, revealing crow's feet around the eyes. He wasn't as young as Murdoch had first thought. Well, he said, they're trying to communicate. Murdoch blinked. Communicate their disease, you mean? In a sense. They're compelled, as you know. They want to spread what the invasive chemicals in their brain insist is the truth about our world, about humanity. But whatever rationality they retain tells them they can't escape quarantine, that they'll die if they try. Murdoch shivered, as he had heard earlier outside in the twilight, even though the coffee and alcohol had warmed him. What do you do about these individuals? His voice was soft, grave. Give them a chance to go back to Manhattan on their own? If not, he raised his hand, thumb and forefinger creating a child's imaginary gun. Pow! It shouldn't have disturbed Murdoch, not in the least. The quarantine's bloody history was known. The Department of Publicity had seen to that. It was good for the general population to know that the outbreak had been dealt with severely, and what were a few more deaths anyway. People died by the thousands in the held territories, soldiers and indigenous alike. The president for life was carrying on the national tradition of aggression, of foreign intervention, of preemptive strikes. He gazed at Caligaris, grateful to whoever it was who had assigned this man to keep him company. This was information he would otherwise never have gotten, though there wasn't a damn thing he could do with any of it in his professional capacity. Once again, dormant journalistic instincts tried to urge him on. What an article he could write about this place, the senseless rituals of the troops, the terrible symbol of the statue out there. He could never publish such a thing through publicity, of course, but there were still underground venues, despite all the crackdowns of the emergency Congress and the perpetual state of martial law. Radical blogs popped up on guerrilla sites. The resistance was out there, a whisper, a shadow. They would love to get a hold of what had learned here. No. Crazy. Suicidal. It was the booze. Murdoch set down his cup. You ever wonder what it's like in there, Murdoch? Caligaris, too, set down his drink, but only after he'd downed the last of it. An odd expression had come to his young old face. He looked levelly at Murdoch who was aware again of how cramped a space this little shed was. It must be an open secret, this place, tolerated by the officers as a release valve for the enlisted, somewhere they could go for brief respites. They weren't really combat troops, after all. This was, in the end, an easy watch, a soft duty. They just had to know how to drill for visitors. The trooper's question hung there, another tantalizing fruit awaiting plucking. Dryly, Murdoch said, I have your commandant's report on conditions inside the quarantine, such as they can be determined from long range. Caligaris picked up on the subtle sarcasm. He offered a grim, wry smile in return. Right. Deplorable conditions. Squalid. No organization. No leadership. They each try to give away their portions from our food drops, so nobody eats. It's all bullshit. If things were like that, they'd all be dead by now, right? I think it was a disaster at first every one of them trying to do everything for everybody else. Mass confusion, wasted efforts. Manhattan was depopulated specifically for their kind, but their chemically induced compulsion requires them to spread their message to others who aren't already infected. So they can't preach to each other. They can't climb over the walls without us gunning them down. They're stuck in there, quarantined. So they had to figure out how to live together. They couldn't all be martyrs and paragons, showing the great unwashed a better way of life, a more tolerant and compassionate mode of living. There's nobody in there to convert. Murdoch had tried to imagine it. An island full of people constrained to help others at any cost, to sacrifice themselves for any reason, to give utterly of their own beings for the greater good of their fellow humans. What do they do if there is no one they can serve? What follows? Madness? Anarchy? Are you saying, Murdoch asked, measuring out the question carefully, that those Christification victims in there have found a way to live together? It flew in the face of a decade of publicity campaigns, which depicted the infected as rabid zombies, aggressively forcing themselves on others, spreading their disease through contact, just like fever, or like the bioweapon the plague ultimately was. Yes, 
said the soldier. They cooperate. That's treason. So it is. His gaze remained level. So much was treason these days, though, thought Murdoch. The charge had lost meaning through overuse. How do you know this? he asked. Again, it was the latent journalist in him, the throwback reporter of an old free press. Ask the next question. Demand a source. Check the statement. Caligaris hesitated this time, but Murdoch sensed he had already made up his mind to say what was next, which was, There is communication between quarantine and Liberty Island. What? It jolted Murdoch. The trooper shrugged with a hint of his earlier nonchalance, but his face remained somber. Not face to face. No danger of transmission. But we can send a message, by embedded radio wave, by stealth drone, hell, by a rolled-up note in a bottle. And we can get a reply. Who knows about this? A few. A very few. Not everybody on Liberty is here because they're obedient wind-up tin soldiers. But the ones who are smart enough to get here for our own reasons, we just keep in step and do as we please. And it pleases you to what? Break the quarantine? Let those Christ zombies touch off a new outbreak? Murdoch caught his breath. Hell, he was sounding like a true cog of the Department of Publicity now. But he didn't understand this man. Why was Caligaris divulging all this? Still, he knew not to ask that direct question. You never interrupted a flow of information. Caligaris shook his head. No. Someone might try that some day. One or two of the radical underground we have on this island have some pretty extreme ideas. But no, not me. My plan is more... personal. Murdoch checked the time. His chopper was scheduled to land any moment. It wouldn't do to have them come looking for him. By now he realized that no one had authorized this trooper to watch over him during his visit. Caligaris was truly working from his own agenda, and that was very dangerous. Still, Murdoch had to find out what this was all about, what this man wanted from him. The soldier reached into a pocket of his coat, and for an instant Murdoch felt a different sort of endangerment. Maybe this man was simply deranged and meant to assassinate him, but he didn't draw a weapon. Instead, he brought out a compact syringe. It held a dark fluid. We don't just trade messages. I asked for this and received it. Something cold touched Murdoch's innards. That's blood. Infected blood. A specific someone's infected blood, in fact. My wife's. Murdoch in that moment wanted to bolt from the place. But again, you didn't interrupt the flow of information, and he needed to know, and plainly Caligaris needed him to know this. How do you know it's hers? Murdoch's voice was surprisingly even. I've communicated with her. She's in there. We were married young. We were very happy. Then she got caught in one of the first outbreaks, the Kansas City one. She was lucky not to have been summarily shot. There was a lot of that going on in the early days, you might remember. Instead, she was rounded up and dropped on the island. My number had come up, and I was already in the service, but I stayed on past my mandatory two years of combat, and I did everything I could to make sure I got transferred to Liberty. Her records were lost in the chaos. Nobody knew I had a wife in quarantine. I've tried to figure out a way to get her out of there. It's impossible. So I'm going in. The horror of it reached Murdoch on a profound level. Someone willing to infect himself? It was nearly beyond human understanding. This man would lose his free will. He would become compulsive. His brain chemistry would force him into a new way of thinking, into uncompromising altruism. He would want only to help and sacrifice and be the goodest of good Samaritans. He would want nothing for himself. If he were nailed up on a cross, and a few were early on, just for laughs, he would talk fellowship and universal love right to the end. Yet this soldier was making a huge sacrifice even before he deliberately infected himself. He was doing it consciously, clear-eyed. He wanted to be back with his wife, at any cost. There was a penetrating integrity in that. It spoke of love beyond the chemically induced kindness of the Christification victims. The syringe remained in the soldier's hand. Above, beyond this little shed, Murdoch heard the thump of helicopter blades. Why have you told me all this? Caligaris leaned forward, and Murdoch had to fight not to recoil. The man wasn't infectious, not yet. The soldier said, I wanted to give you a real story. Who knows? You might do something with it. 
He smiled stonily. I will wait until you're in the air before I inject myself. Kelly Murdoch stood. With a last look at Caligaris, he went out through the door and hurried across the grounds as the chopper circled down toward the pad. The inscription had been removed long ago. That drivel about poor and tired and a promised welcome of some sort, she didn't stand for that anymore. He looked up at her as the wash from the helicopter struck him, wanting to fix this image in his head, but grit blew in his eyes and he turned away from the statue and let himself be led into the aircraft, buckled in, the door slammed shut. They rose off of Liberty Island, rising above the containment walls and the waters of the empty harbor. The searchlight swept once across the chopper, then its light was thrown once more toward the erstwhile city. No one knew what terrorist group had bioengineered the insidious plague. Hell, it might have been one mad scientist in a lab making a breakthrough in neural chemical experimentation. Maybe all of it had been a test run. Who the hell knew? Or perhaps the plague had been a good-intentioned effort to reverse course, to make a desperate correction, to undo the bloodshed promised for the future were the world to continue as it had. In a sense, the intent didn't matter. The crusade had failed. The plague was more or less contained. The strays that turned up were those who had been living in isolation, usually the victims' loved ones keeping them locked up and out of infectious range, caring for them even as they compulsively and quixotically tried to serve in any way, frantic to give of themselves. But what about Caligaris? Murdoch wondered as the helicopter swept him away from New York, back to the environs of the Department of Publicity. The soldier with the vial of his wife's blood would inject himself, thus taking on the disease. An outbreak would occur there on Liberty Island itself. Surely it would be contained. Surely. But would anyone ever hear about it? Would the incident be immediately covered up? Murdoch had foreknowledge of it. He knew the incredible backstory. Certainly he couldn't disseminate the story through official channels, but there were other ways. Pirate sites, means of distributing dissident information. It was as Caligaris had said. You might do something with it. Before they had cleared New York's restricted airspace, Kelly Murdoch had made up his mind about what he was going to do with the story. Eric Del Carlo has been selling his fiction for over two decades. His short stories have appeared in Asimov's, Strange Horizons, and many, many other venues. His novels, both solo and collaborative, have been published by Ace Books, Dark Star Books, Loose Id, and other houses. His latest book, The Golden Gate is Empty, written with his father, Vic Del Carlo, is currently available from White Cat Publishing. Eric is a native Californian and a Hurricane Katrina refugee. Find him on Facebook for comments and questions. This has been a production of the Brick Moon Fiction Podcast. If you like what you've heard, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or visit us at our webpage, brickmoonfiction.com.